you. Um, so despite me being a stand-up comedian, I don't like holding a mic, so I'm, I'm hoping that this is projecting enough uh, for everybody, but if anyone ever has any problems hearing, just let me know. Um, so yeah, as, as Michael mentioned, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, what happened in early July in the Bitcoin network, um, how the network sort of adapted, how participants in the network adapted, and in particular, how uh, BlockCypher uh, adapted as an infrastructure company um, here in sort of uh, ba based off of the, the attack that, that happened uh, in July. So uh, to start, um, I won't go over uh, much of the intros again, but uh, as Michael mentioned, I'm the developer advocate for BlockCypher. Uh, I love helping developers build awesome stuff on Bitcoin. Uh, and, and various other cryptocurrencies. Uh, and this is the only part of the presentation where I'm just going to be a shameless promoter for BlockCypher, I swear. Uh, but uh, BlockCypher is, is a way to make development a lot easier for folks that are interested in building on blockchain. So uh, we're basically like an Amazon Web Services for blockchains. Uh, so if you, uh, instead of running your own Bitcoin Core daemon, you can just hit a JSON API. It's mostly RESTful super robust, best SLA in the business. Um, you get to focus on your idea and we focus on the infrastructure. So that's it. Um, we'll, we'll save the, the shilling for later. Um, and instead, let's just go ahead and dive in to what happened in, uh, in, in early July. So I don't know how many of you guys were like celebrating Independence Day. It was a you know, fun holiday. Most people do celebrate Independence Day. Unfortunately, for people in the Bitcoin world, uh, they, they had a, a a different kind of independence, the independence of a soft fork. Um, so uh, this graph behind me uh, is, is basically showing the average uh, number of blocks that have, uh, of the last thousand blocks, uh, the number of them have, that have gotten to version three, uh, which is part of BIP 66. Uh, so you'll notice that uh, in this date around here, July 4th is when uh, basically BIP 66 went from uh, activation to enforcement. And, and the reason that that uh, ended up being such a big issue, here's sort of a brief explainer on what BIP66 uh, actually does. So um, BIP66 is uh, effectively a, a reduction of the, the kinds of signatures that are allowed in, in Bitcoin transactions. Uh, so it enforces what are called strict DER signatures uh, in the code. Um, and previously, Bitcoin had been relying on OpenSSL uh, to provide those signatures. Uh, as we all know from, if anyone recognizes that icon, reliance on OpenSSL is not exactly the best idea ever. Um, and so this, uh, this Bitcoin improvement proposal was uh, basically uh, created to reduce that reliance and to reduce also the number of possible outcomes for signatures in, in Bitcoin. And it followed sort of a similar path to BIP 34, uh, which is to say once 750 out of the last 1,000 blocks uh, had version 3 blocks, which denoted satisfying uh, uh, BIP, BIP 66, then uh, the rules would be activated for all blocks that had V3 um, as, as their version number. Um, it then uh, made V2 blocks invalid after you reached 950 blocks out of the last 1,000. So what was sort of supposed to happen uh, was something like this. Uh, so where there was always a chance, even after BIP66 was activated, that there would be an invalid block mined by 5% of the hashing power. Uh, and that chain could have been longer, but uh, the probability of that chain becoming longer gets vanishingly small so long as the, major the vast majority of hashing power uh, was, you know, mining uh, valid, valid uh, blocks. Um, and so effectively what we all expected to happen is that when miners were saying that they enforced v3 blocks, uh, we thought that they were telling the truth and they were actually uh, validating those those blocks themselves. But it didn't end up happening that way. Um, instead, as it turned out, miners were signaling that they were enforcing those blocks, aka they were putting V3 into the blocks that they were mining. But in reality, many of them, roughly 50%, uh, it seems, uh, were not actually uh, checking to see if they were uh, conforming to those BIP66 rules. 
and what ended up happening is that we had a six block soft fork uh, on July 4th and then another three block soft fork uh, in, on July 5th. Um, now the main, main reason this is a big problem is that the miners were signaling that they were in fact uh, conforming to these rules, but in reality they were acting quite, quite differently. Um, so the reason that, that they were acting differently is that they were basically trying to gain a certain amount of speed advantage in the network. So by uh, most of these miners were uh, validating, uh, weren't validating any transactions in the block. They were doing what's called SPV mining. But a better term for that would have been basically like just looking at the headers and mining off of those block headers instead of actually mining off of the full block and validating all those transactions. If they'd been doing that full validation, then this fork wouldn't have happened. Um, so what, did, what does this all mean for the end user at this point? Basically, everyone in Bitcoin was told, like, just wait for this to blow over. Um, so there was, I believe, if any of you went to the Bitcoin.org page, there was a big do not, you know, do not transact unless you've got 30 confirmations. There was all of this um, uh, basically like a lot of, uh, of confusion about whether people uh, were on the right, the right fork or not. And a lot of credit, I think, goes to the Bitcoin core developers who were actively engaged in uh, conversations with some of these miners to get them to uh, actually get back on the right, the right fork, so to speak. Um, but, but ultimately, like, this, this wasn't really, I mean, it was a pretty big deal temporarily. Um, but it wasn't as big of a deal as, as sort of what happened next, I think, fundamentally uh, to, the, to the rest of the network. Um, so in July 6th, not a day later, after having just dealt with that fork, um, we suffered a massive attack. And, and unfortunately, not um, famed trip hop British sensation massive attack, um, although it definitely caused some teardrops to those of you who know their discography. Um, so. Um, how many people actually heard about uh, the spam attack on July 6th? Was there? OK, OK, awesome, great. Um, so, so I'm glad that you, you all said that, because there, there did seem to be a, a fair amount of confusion about it, uh, at least on a lot of online communities. A lot of people thought it was a continuation of a stress test. Uh, but in reality, it was sort of a sophisticated, well-funded uh, d denial of service attack on, on the Bitcoin network. Um, and I'll sort of explain that in a minute. But um, effectively, in, in early June, and this is a little frenetic, so I'll just stay on this slide just for a little bit so you can appreciate the, the GIFs, and then we'll move on. Um, so uh, in, in early June, coinwallet.eu announced that they were going to engage in a stress test on the, the Bitcoin network. Um, and they did so on June 22nd. And they announced on June 28th, but it didn't really in, end up hitting until June 30th or so. Um, Many people confuse that stress, uh, stress test for the actual spam attack that occurred uh, right after the BIP66 fork. Um, and you can tell the difference quite starkly just by looking uh, at even just this one indicator. So this is TPS's transactions per second. Um, you can see June 22nd doesn't even go you know, above, above a line there. And then June 30th, you see a, a little bit of a, of a bump in transactions per second. But the spam attack, which started on June 6th, is a completely different animal. Uh, completely different. So you're talking about spiking up to a 200 transactions per second. Uh, the, the transactions themselves, unlike the stress test in June, they were varied. They had various amounts of inputs and outputs. Uh, it was much more volatile and, and people were just sort of unsure where it was coming from. No one was claiming responsibility. So it was a completely different animal uh, compared to those stress tests. Um, as a quick refresher, um, why does it matter if TPS is above a certain amount. Um, there is inherently a TPS limit in, in Bitcoin. Um, I'm sure many of you already, already know this math, so it might be uh, repeating it a little bit. But, but just in case those in the audience don't, don't know, um, so every, uh, roughly every 10 minutes per block, uh, or per, uh, 10, roughly every 10 minutes a block is discovered in the Bitcoin network. That is just an average, and it varies quite wildly, as is the nature in, in the random process that is block uh, discovery. Um, those blocks have a one megabyte limit, and the minimum, uh, amount of, uh, the minimum amount of size for each transaction is around 250 bytes. That's for one input and two outputs. Um, if you just do the math, you know, a million bytes divided by 250 is around 4,000 transactions per block. 
4,000 transactions divided by 600 seconds, and you get 6.6 .6 TPS. And in the real world, it's actually a little bit lower because not every transaction is the minimum. In fact, in the middle of this attack, someone mined a one megabyte transaction, even though the the is uh, you know the the is standard test only allows up to 100 kilobyte transactions, but they were a miner, and so they could they could do what they wanted there. Um, but, but effectively, like the real world TPS limit is actually uh, quite a bit lower. And so what happens when the TPS limit goes above uh, that block discovery limit? Normally, uh, the mempool stays around 2,000 to 3,000 transactions, and they all get cleared away into the next block. That didn't happen um, in this spam attack. The mempool. Number, number of transactions. Oh, sorry? What was that number? Oh, uh, like 2,000 to 3,000. Yeah, yeah, uh, roughly, although that's, you know, that's an average and it sort of depends, but generally that corresponds to the uh, block being about half full. So most blocks are around, or before the spam attack, were around 500 kilobytes or so. Um, so when, when TPS goes beyond that, you know, like four, that four mark, five mark, um, the mempool balloons. Um, and the reason that's bad is because it, it causes huge strain on individual nodes and ultimately it creates this sort of disparity on the amount of transactions that are actually uh, securely embedded in the blockchain and transactions that are just sort of floating around uh, in mempools. So uh, effectively, my favorite uh, euphemism is that the attacker decided to drop the kids off at the mempool, uh, which if you, if you know the meaning of that idiom, it is literally like crapping up the mempool. Um, and a lot of, a lot of uh, nodes broke under the pressure. Um, so, effectively, what happened is that the, you know, the mempool itself just had all of these cars as transactions, and they're trying to be funneled into uh, the limited sort of space that was available uh, in, in those blocks, and it was kind of metaphorically similar to this. Um, in essence, real estate in the blockchain became fundamentally precious, right? In most normal cases, the block is only half full before the spam attack. Uh, so you had around 500 kilobytes per block. Um, and after this, you had, at one point, the mempool got up to 200,000 uh, know, transactions. And of those 200,000 transactions, miners uh, are only incentivized to find the top 4,000 in terms of fees and then sort of leave the, the rest off. And you can imagine there being like a huge backlog problem uh, from additional transactions coming into the mempool uh, in addition to those already there. Um, so, so real estate became uh, less like uh, sort of nuclear test grounds in Nevada and more like San Francisco real estate. Fees went up about 25 time, 25x on the minimum and around 3x for uh, most average fees. It also created uh, the appearance of double spends. Uh, so in reality, these double spends were, it was a mixture of a number of, of, of things. It, was, it wasn't just people attempting to malevolently double spend. Uh, some degree w uh, of double spends were from people just trying to respend their Bitcoin that weren't being confirmed in a block. Um, another, another portion was people trying to malevolently double spend, take advantage of the sort of uh, chaos of the, of the spam transactions. Uh, and then a little bit was also the attacker trying to reduce the uh, cost of the attack by respending their own um, their own transactions as well. So that luckily uh, that died down, and by July 18th, 19th, 20th, the mempool was back to normal size, and and you know we we continued on as a network, so that's great. Um, but I think it'd be interesting, especially since uh, y'all are Bitcoin developers, to go into how uh, BlockCypher, uh, how our infrastructure was text, tes uh, tested, and how we responded. And to borrow, uh, if anyone is a Go programmer, um, you're undoubtedly intimately familiar with that particular line, which is everywhere in Go code base. But to borrow a little bit from our code base to uh, if error is not equal to nil is, is sort of human. Um, and so we are, while we, we pride ourselves at being the most reliable, uh, robust uh, blockchain API in the business, uh, we did have, we did have some, some shortcomings that we resolved as a result of the spam attack. Um, so the first thing that happened is that these double spends ended up revealing slow code. Uh, so in our, um, in our implementation of a Bitcoin node, uh, we were basically doing a double for loop uh, to detect and, and 
uh, in addition, not just a text, sorry, uh, but to ascribe a certain double spend to an address, uh, we were testing every single address, regardless of whether uh, one of them was associated with a double spend. And that was a really easy fix, as it turns out, because um, all you had to do was look at uh, you know, the double spend and it would show you addresses associated with that transaction and we went from you know, that weird OIJ uh, notation to just OI basically. Um, but the thing is, uh, what's, what's interesting is that uh, we would have never known about this particular piece of code uh, because uh, we didn't really need to optimize before. There are only so many double spend attempts that were happening and uh, it wasn't you know, uh, bringing down a, a piece of our infrastructure uh, which it didn't bring down, I should say, uh, but it did, it did uh, spike our CPU utilization up quite a bit. So uh, once we realized that that double spend graph was uh, what was causing this, this was a super easy fix. It was like a six line piece of code. So the other thing that this sort of uh, brought to our attention is that uh, our webhooks infrastructure got uh, tested a great deal. Um, so one, one of the things, you know, we have an events based system where uh, whenever some, something happens, we can send out notifications either through WebSockets or uh, webhooks. Um, and we kind of had a perfect storm of a variety of events uh, that our customers subscribe to that resulted in massive, massive spikes. So in addition to that double spend graph that you saw, uh, we, had, uh, we have an unconfirmed transaction webhook event. And when you have 100, 200 TPS and many, many, many customers uh, subscribe to that, uh, you can see how that would potentially stress things. Uh, additionally, um, there was a parallel attack happening on testnet 3 and the way our architecture works is actually abstracted out, uh, you know, our events uh, architecture is abstracted out from whichever blockchain that we're actually, uh, uh, you know, querying. So effectively, um, there was a perfect storm of all of this stuff happening, even worse on testnet in some cases during the spam attack. Um, luckily, you know, this was actually a, a, also a relatively simple fix in that um, it, a lot of this infrastructure sort of scaled linearly. So ultimately all we, all we did is threw machine power at the problem and it wasn't as big of a deal and we, we kind of moved on. The last thing uh, that was sort of a huge problem um, initially and one that was a little bit more subtle is what I was mentioning before about our mempool infrastructure, uh, or about mempools in general. So the way that we had uh, our uh, unconfirmed uh, transactions associated with addresses was basically like a giant map. So the key was the, the address and the value was this sort of pseudo object that we call a, a transaction reference. Um, and we were storing this for every single address regardless of whether anyone was querying that address against our system. So we were, we were doing this again previously because the mempool uh, was never much larger than 2,000 transactions. You bump that up by 100x and you start to see the strain on, on infrastructure. Um, so we, we streamlined it. Um, effectively, uh, we generated this information on demand and instead of having that full transaction reference object in memory, in active memory, uh, all we have is the un unconfirmed uh, transaction hashes. And if we ever needed to uh, actually build that response, we would just do it on demand and we had a, a few layers of caching involved that keeps it relatively intelligent and still to the point where no one really noticed any uh, degradation of surface at all. Um, but that, that took a little bit longer to, um, to figure out and to adapt. Uh, but ultimately, like it, it was a really, really great project for us because it streamlined our mempool uh, implementation to the point that um, now we could hold a million addresses and you know with 15 transactions each and only take 400 megabytes in, in active memory. Um, so that was a, a really, really huge improvement. Um, so uh, to sort of go back to um, what you know the conclusions uh, about this particular attack uh, and and what we've learned I think as a as a Bitcoin community the silver lining is that um, Bitcoin was sort of robust uh, the network can handle 200 transactions per second quite well uh, whether they get into a blockchain swiftly uh, you know it's, it's it's the open question but the network survived and and for the most part um, most folks. Uh, you know, didn't really notice too much of a disruption of service, except for folks who 
in the very beginning, uh, sent out transactions. Um, and, and for many people who were using wallets that didn't have any sort of adaptive fee structure, they were also left out in, in the dark a little bit, uh, which was one of the problems, um, which I'll sort of get into now. So the, the first big problem with, that this attack showed is that it was way, way too cheap, like way too cheap. Um, ultimately, uh, it's, it's of a level where if someone just wants to spend, you know, five grand going to Vegas or five grand disrupting a global payment network, you know, they could choose to disrupt a global payment network. And that's, I'd rather they go to Vegas, you know, I'd rather they lose their money there. Um, so the reason that, the, the where I come up with this five grand, um, if you take, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, blocks before the spam attack were roughly 500 kilobytes or so. What the attacker had to do was fill up those blocks and, and then some, and at minimum, uh, that meant filling up that extra 500 kilobytes with the minimum fee necessary. And if you sort of do the math again, it's around 16.2 Bitcoin um, uh, you know, per 10 minutes, or sorry, 16.2 Bitcoin per day, which uh, winds up going to about $4,600 or five grand. Um, so the, the next problem is that it created a new normal in, in higher fees. So yes, disruption in, in service for most Bitcoin users uh, that had wallets that adapted to, you know, having estimated fees, you know, it wasn't affected. Um, but ultimately, they were being charged at a much higher rate than they were previously. And the big problem there, for, so for many of you, you probably don't care if you're, uh, you know, spending five cents or 15 cents to include a transaction in the blockchain. That doesn't make a material difference to anyone in, in the audience here. Uh, that makes a massive difference, massive, massive difference if you're trying to pitch Bitcoin as a solution to the unbanked, right? To folks that are in the, in the third world trying to uh, be a part of internet commerce, if all of a sudden their fee structure goes up to a point where it materially affects their ability to live, uh, that's, I mean, that's a huge problem. So uh, in order for, I mean, I think that that, you know, for most people like, oh no, I have to pay another, you know, 10 cents, 15 cents or something. Uh, I don't really care about us. I care about the future use cases of Bitcoin and how, uh, how big of a problem this could be later on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think so. It's like 80, 80 bytes per op return. It's still like 300 bytes and then like 60,000 Satoshis per kilobyte, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, which, so then, yeah, some of those data embedding, you know, it, it used to be a lot cheaper to embed data in the blockchain. Uh, that's right, that's right. Uh, which, which does disrupt a you know, complete other use case, not even related to sort of the unbanked, but just for people that are trying to do stuff like proof of existence or colored coins off of Bitcoin as well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think that's a, I mean, that's a huge problem and something that, that should be addressed or, or thought about or resolved. Um, and then the other, um, the other big issue, uh, which I sort of highlighted a bit on our own, you know, in our own infrastructure uh, and our own adaptation to it, um, is that large mempools relative to block size are really, really bad. Um, th and the truth is that the mempool is a misnomer. In reality, it's a number of mempools. You know, uh, everyone has their own implementation. Uh, everyone has their own hardware they're running these mempools off of. Uh, and, and ultimately, like, in the middle of this attack, there were nodes coming on and offline as they crashed and wiping their, their mempools. Now, granted, most, you know, most people ended up trying to rebroadcast, but that creates uncertainty, you know? And that creates, uh, certainly for the end user uh, who tries sending Bitcoin and, and expects a 10-minute confirmation and gets no feedback on that, that's, that's really, really, really bad. Um, and now there, there are potentially ways, ways around this, but, but it's still, I, I think what we all have to keep in mind is that ultimately we don't want transactions in the mempool, we want them on the blockchain, right? And the larger the mempool is uh, relative to block size, the harder it is to get those, uh, to get those transactions into the blockchain. So uh, the golden, and I adjusted this since my last, presentation slash Bitcoin lining, if we're going to look at Bitcoin as the new gold, uh, is that these issues are all uh, solvable. Um, the, uh, what's already happened in Bitcoin Core 0.11 to, uh, again, the Bitcoin Core developers credits, uh, they are uh, created options for nodes to limit free transactions and to 
up the minimum fee required for re relays, um, which will maybe make it more expensive for these attacks if a lot of nodes uh, voluntarily decide to get involved in that policy. I think the other, um, and this is, might be a hot button issue, and I apologize to bring it up, but the other uh, key here, or one, uh, one astute observation, is that uh, uh, larger block sizes uh, would make a lot of these issues uh, less problematic. So the attack itself, if you're talking about, uh, you know, a 20 megabyte block, uh, the attack itself would be 19, you know, 19x more expensive. Uh, so it's still well within the reach of some angry state actors who want to uh, torpedo Bitcoin, which is still a problem, right? But it's it's out of reach of someone who's having a bad day and doesn't want to go to Vegas. So. That's, that's uh, I think that's pretty relevant. And the other relevant thing is that ultimately, like more of these transactions would be, uh, would get out of the mempool and into a block more quickly. Um, so uh, I, I ultimately think that there, there are other potential solutions here. Um, and ultimately, I think the real golden lining here is that Bitcoin as a network survived uh, and was proven to be quite robust. And so that's really, that's really ultimately the, the, the best news, is that everything still works, um, but we can make it work better. Um, so uh, if, other than the questions that I'm, uh, you know, we're about to go into, if you want more, uh, you know, we have our, our blog posts and we are hiring, so just, uh, you know, say hi to me or anyone, uh, unless someone other than our, us in the company put on the free t-shirts, uh, anyone in a block cycle t-shirt. Uh, that'd be an interesting conversation. I'd like to see that one, actually, for uh, someone wearing the free t-shirt. But, uh, but yeah, so um, thank you, guys. And, uh, and yeah, I'll open the floor to, to questions or, or comments. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? I mean, do you feel like this was a politically motivated attack having to do with the, the block sizes and stuff? So I, I, I mean, and, and in the last presentation um, I gave about this, like it's, I think you can, it's, it's hard to speculate when, when no one has made their intent, you know, um, known. I like to, I'm, I'm an optimist, uh, uh, a perennial optimist, so I, I like to believe that whoever was doing this, even if it was, um, you know, somewhat malevolent initially, ultimately it resulted in lots of adaptation on the part of the players in the network, our own infrastructure notwithstanding, Lots of wallets, which were previously just doing you know static fee estimation, wound up um, you know uh, sending critical updates to their users, getting them to update their you know their wallet software, and all of a sudden you know they had fee estimation and so on. So I, I like to believe uh, that whoever was doing this hopefully had uh, some you know positive intent. Um, it's it's really weird though. I mean, ultimately. Uh, if they were stress testing the network or claiming they were stress testing the network, I don't understand why they didn't, they didn't go out and, and say it. Um, the coinwallet.eu folks did, but they did it in June and, and there was no you know, record of them saying that they were going to be involved in this July attack at all. Um, so uh, I think it is, you know, it's, it's still considered a malevolent attack based off of all the data that we have now. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm happy that we've adapted and that it's shown some of the issues. And, and I mean, frankly, it does scare me a little bit that it's that cheap to sort of do what I would call a denial of service attack uh, on, on the Bitcoin network. But um, I do think that we can adapt. So, so uh, block size increase only provides a linear cost increase to attacking the network in this capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, does block cipher have any ideas as to how to make that cost exponential? at least quadratic, if not exponential? Uh, so my much smarter engineers might. I, I, I personally... Uh, Get them up here. <laughs> yeah, actually, but, but, but uh, no, in, all, in, 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 all, uh, in all honesty, um, I'm not sure what the quick answer would be to that question. I think that's a, that is the right line of questioning, because you're right, like ultimately block size only creates um, you know, a, linear, uh, a linear curve, and, and ultimately like if we want to keep you know, fees low, um, that's always going to be linear, right? Because if fees wind up being, you know, a dollar per transaction, that might prevent this sort of attack in a larger block size, but it would also prevent some of the primary use cases of Bitcoin. So I think that's, a, that's an open question, how to make it that way. Um, I guess so, yeah. Is there any evidence suggesting that it was like one single attacker? 
Uh, like were there did certain you, addresses well, that were spending? So there was there was um, that that mega transaction that F two pool did uh, was basic. Someone realized that all the addresses that were being spent to were part of very simple brain wallets like cat and stuff. So that was I think the what seemed to be the common thread that that made people believe that it was a single party. I mean it, it could be obviously there, there could be this effect where uh, transaction per second goes up and then all of a sudden people try to get their transactions in or maybe they, they worry about the fidelity of the network and it causes this avalanche effect. I don't, I don't know if that, if that happened necessarily, but there's I think enough evidence to support just based off that brain wallet thing that it was like a single party engaging in it. Yeah. Actually, I actually have two questions. Sure. One is you mentioned there were 200,000 transactions in the medical uh, mm -hmm. larger. So one simple question is, how long did it take the longest transaction to get on the, I mean, uh, the longest time to get the, the transaction on, on the blockchain? I actually, I am sad to say I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, then uh, the other question is uh, more speculative. Mm -hmm. You know, there's various speculations about motivation. One could be, you know, what you just said, the tough love mm -hmm. for Bitcoin, you know, to really, you know, slap it around, make, uh, show the strength of the protocol, but doesn't tell us makes us stronger. Sure. And another could be politically made, make Bitcoin look bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but another one could be, I'm wondering, is there any kind of financial reward of either arbitraging across currencies or something? Because the reason is that 5,000 is a lot to the average person. But not to someone who's making six thousand mm -hmm. per day on the five thousand expenditure. Yeah. So on. Yeah. So the, the, I, I can see that. Um, so I can see that argument, that line of reasoning. I, I, I think there are some folks that were propo or proposing speculation that it might have been in some speculators' interest. But I, I looked at sort of the, the math that they were doing, and ultimately, all of this, all this pressure would have just driven, in some sense, the price up of bit, of Bitcoin. Right? Like they would have to buy more Bitcoin, if they didn't hold some already, uh, there would be pressure for them to buy more and then increase sort of the, the, the cost of the attack itself, right? By buying more Bitcoin, that raises the price of Bitcoin, and then the fees themselves uh, wind up becoming uh, you know, higher that way as well. Um, but I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, so one option to make way more than $5,000 a day uh, with, with extensive network, there are several sites that accept uh, zero confirmation uh, transactions like gambling sites or uh, Shapeshift used to uh, accept zero information transactions, and there's such a lot of memory with double spending transactions, and uh, you can make easily more than that on today. Yeah, although in, in um, so in Shapeshift's case, there was a successful double spend that happened um, in the uh, what's going on over there. Uh, so. Uh, there was a successful double spend, but it was actually um, caught relatively quickly, and and they wound up uh, not losing. Yeah, there are as opposed to spending five grand. I think there are, yeah, there there are. Yeah, specifically you market for. And if you know you have a risk mitigation tool like say Block Cipher's confidence factor that has seen a lot of these these double spend attempts before, you could also mitigate the total loss that you have from those unconfirmed. Potentially, I promised I wouldn't do any corporate shilling, but that was my last one. I swear. So, any forward-looking things like I mean, we have a, a um, uh, mining price having next year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a variety of proposals, none of which seem to have momentum yet on mm -hmm. block size. Do you have any forward-looking things that we should be, you know, looking at here? Well, like in, well I, I mean, more than anything, I think, uh, I, I'm not sure what the right consensus might be on, on uh, what the right proposal is for increasing block size or, um, you know, what the right 
right way to reduce the effectiveness of this kind of attack. Um, I just know that we should be working on it, you know? I mean, I, I sort of want to just put the focus on, on what happened in, in July um, to just sort of, because it seemed like when it was happening, um, no, I mean, there was, there was discussions about it, but no one really put the spotlight on how fees went up and how that basically limits uh, so many of the use cases of Bitcoin that all of us, I think, uh, very deeply want to, to see happen. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know, you know, what what are the right steps forward right you know right now. Um, but I, I think that we should be you know working on it. And I do know that, that uh, to the Bitcoin core developers uh, credit again that there are people thinking about seeing having seen this attack uh, and wanting to make you know iterative change there. Um, so I, that's I, I mean I think that, that we just need to be working on that as a community. Yeah. seemed like it was informal. It was happening in the middle of the night, and so-and-so happened to be online, and they called so-and-so, and then they tried to reach miners in China, yeah. and they were lucky that they got them on the phone. Mm -hmm. My point is, that just doesn't seem like a, a robust response for something that's supposed to be mm -hmm. the understandings of the global economy. So the question yeah. is, what lessons learned? What are changes in governance? Sure, sure. So there's um and, and you're referring specifically to the BIP sixty six for more than anything. Yeah. So um I think the big lesson there is um there's so a lot of people when that when that fork happened uh, they suggested that there's something broken with the sort of SPV security mechanism as a result of that fork. But in my mind, it actually suggested that something was wrong with the way that um, that miners could signal intent, but then have different behavior than what they were actually signaling. Um, which is really, I mean, that seems like a pretty fundamental uh, flaw in, in the way the system currently works now, and something that should be, um, you know, prevented somehow. Uh, and I, I, again, don't have the right answer necessarily, but I feel like there needs to be a spotlight in how, like, voting for something, in this case, voting for the V3 block, and then having completely different behavior in the implementation of that rule is a problem, right? And and I don't. I mean, isn't it important to point out that like the SPV mining crap that people were doing yeah. that caused an actual fork? It the government everything worked correctly. Uh, the fact that pools had to be called and informed that they were creating invalid crap that the network was ignoring was really only a like courtesy call. Of, hey, you're wasting money right now. Like yeah. everything works. We don't need, like there's nothing wrong with things. I was referring to like oh. there's only three people that have the level of our key. One is Satoshi, one's Yeah, but the other key isn't oh. actually relevant here, right? Like the other right. key, the other system's being turned off slowly anyway, because it's crap and no one cares and no one wants to use it. Well, it just it just seems like very informal or something that in theory should be a lot more robust. Yeah. I mean the formal mechanism is oh you're losing money right now. Well, it was it, it was in their best. I mean, yeah, the meta consensus is ultimately like if you wind up in a six or seven block fork uh, and you're not running valid, change, but but I, I actually like if, if the invalid, uh, ha, you know, if, if more people, if the majority were SPV mining, right, for example, then that fork could have persisted for a lot longer. And so what? It breaks SPV clients. If you're running an SPV client accepting large value payments, then that's your fault. My, miners were not validating blocks correctly, period. So therefore, they deserve to lose money. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> the rules of the system said, if you mine invalid blocks, you will lose your money. So they mined invalid blocks and they lost their money. Yeah, lost the Great. Although, well, uh, uh, yeah, it's fair. I feel like that debate summed up right there, so I'm not going to inject any other comments. Um, yeah, any other, any other questions? All right. oh, yeah. One last question. Uh, do you think that uh, block size be damned? Uh, zero confirmation is, is a big problem. Do you feel that if we can solve the zero confirmation issue, mm -hmm. that this problem goes away? And maybe something like SNARKs, ZKP, whatever solves this problem, where it's a, a proof of payment or a deliverable proof that the payment is valid versus waiting for blockchain validation? So there are, uh, there are a lot of strategies, I think, that you can employ um, when 
like dealing with zero confirmation payments. I wouldn't necessarily like say that this this is an indicator that zero conf is is broken at all. Um, and even you know, I I wrote a, a blog piece about uh, that shapeshift double spend and. And ultimately, like they were using our tool correctly, and that was a risk mitigation tool. And people that use that particular tool, for example, um, they do it with sort of knowledge that there is there is a non-zero but small chance that a successful double spend will occur uh, against a particular transaction. There are other, uh, I think, strategies like you know two of two or payment channels or a variety of different ways. I think that uh, you know developers or business uh, business owners can still comfortably accept. Payments that aren't um, in in the blockchain, uh, or you know, that are unconfirmed before reaching the blockchain. Uh, what I, I I guess what what I um, what I think is more problematic is the idea that that there can be an unconfirmed payment that exists for that long and that persists for that long in the mempool. Well, isn't um, the solution that we threw them away then? I, I don't know that. I, Remove I, them from mempool. I mean, sure, but then, but then, if if everyone does that, you know, for any transaction that they want, then effectively, like, you don't have a degree of consistency about transactions that actually get in the blockchain, right? Why do you need consistency about which transactions from any of those mempools that's in the blockchain? I care about my transaction. I continue broadcasting it until it gets in, or increase the fee, or whatever. That's already what's happening, though. Sorry. That's already my top of you go, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. So, like, go to the left. So, that was what was going on when it was working. Yeah. Like, I guess it was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, for folks, I mean, I think the real problem is really not necessarily for folks like us that know that we need to, like, respend or rebroadcast. It's more on the end user side, right? Like, yeah, well, I mean, that and I think for the wallet developer right? side. Okay. In regards to visibility. Mm -hmm. What is happening? If you don't have any idea of what's happening, then how right. do you know what's being rebroadcast? Really I, so I think like the, the biggest benefit. Like, like, yeah, that's that's true too. And after the point also that what it's become more and more complicated. I think one of the writing when it's a free or you know free goal. Um, mm -hmm. Then we now have to worry about rebroadcasts, different relay policies, how to worry about actually higher fees, mm -hmm. which the <coughs> With a profile of one transaction compared to another, um, that becomes really complicated. And it's really hard to write through that because it's already non trivial and it becomes high, it becomes really, really high. Because in which case, there's going to be no good way. Well, it's already not that many good way, and there's going to be no good way anymore ever because it's kind of hard. Yep. Don't worry about the UX. So I guess as a result of this, the transaction fees are higher. Mm -hmm. Other than block size, what strategies could we use to lower the transaction fees again? Well, I ultimately I think it's it's about figuring out um, how to disincentivize someone from engaging in a spam attack mm -hmm. like this. But I don't. That's transaction I'm, I, fees. But that's transaction fees, you know, in some sense. So there's got to be. I, I'm not sure what the you know the the meta game is there is there is I mean on one hand there's a certain amount of um, there's there's a certain buffer against this sort of attack because eventually if they continue to to do the attack they're raising the fees on themselves right but by the time they do that they might you know uh, have already attacked the network for so long that it becomes infeasible for people to use Bitcoin at, as a payment network at that point for most use cases right. Like if you know if you're if you're spending like a dollar per transaction to put in the blockchain, then that's sort of you know I, I think that that's the sign of a network that hasn't you know, lived up to its, its promise. Um, but you know I I don't know I don't know the answer I, I I wish I did but I hope that you know in some sense that this is just sort of like uh, highlighting one of the sort of fundamental issues that none of us I I mean in many respects I think none of us really anticipated or thought was. Uh, you know, possible, but in retrospect, in 2020 hindsight, like makes perfect sense. Well, of course, someone can do this if they wanted to, and now we have to figure out like, how we adapt to it. I mean, it just seems like as the reward for mining keeps having mm -hmm. the transaction fees must offset that. 
I just don't know where that would lie for mm -hmm. five years, ten years in the future. 60, 21, mm -hmm. 40, mm -hmm. or whatever it may be. Right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure what that world looks like either. Um, I think ultimately, you know, if we still have a one megabyte block in 2140, we've done something <laughs> wrong. Um, but, but I, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know. Um, but I mean, if you look at the Satoshi graph, mm -hmm. the transaction fees according to that original schedule that he designed should be much higher. Should go up. That, that was by design, is yeah. that transaction fees do go up over time, that some other uh, instant payment protocol takes over after the fact. <laughs> and we're, we're not seeing that emerge well, necessarily. Your, 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 your miners are being rewarded because they've got clean They're, coins yeah. that they can sell for a premium. They can, they can um, gain the system in a variety yeah. of different ways and they can speculate. Mm -hmm. so. Block, block size is not the answer. We have to find another option, period. Well, but I, I, block size is not remotely the answer to this. Yeah. I, I digress. I should agree. Yeah, should agree. Not no, this so is I, the I, forum for that. But uh, yeah, I didn't. I mean, I I, I think that there are a, a number of solutions that involve many different strategies, not just one thing or the other. And I, I personally am really excited about Lightning Network. Uh, I've seen I've seen you, you know folks here speak about it, and I'm I love I love to see that sort of innovation happen. Um, but I do think that it's not just like one or the other. There's there's no, a lot, yeah. a lot, a lot here that we can do. Well, but like, I remember, I think earlier someone brought up a question about like, well, you know, if we just linearly increase the block size, if just linearly increases the cost of this attack, but like something like Lightning or a channel based solution like that mm -hmm. increases the cost of the attack significantly because all of a sudden, uh, instead of transaction fees for individual transactions. 20 cents, transaction fees for settlement transactions once a month go to 20 cents. Sure, so although. Very different. Although the, there's an open question in the Lightning Network about how the, the fees are created and assessed by people providing the service of, of having their Bitcoin locked up. Um, and I don't know what those fees will look like. And, I don't, and, and you know, to be honest, like. Oh, I, I'm sorry, yeah. There are additional fees in the network. In, in the network, network, right? Just just sure, just sure on the blockchain. Well, sure, let, sure. Let's just but, get rid of unconfirmed transactions altogether and use snarks or zero knowledge proofs in general, and then we don't have to worry about unconfirmed transactions altogether. I'm not sure that that's necessarily, at least right now, uh, given that so many people are already using them effectively uh, and without really many issues at all. Um, and there's like one, the, the issues that people do have get a lot of press because, oh my God, a successful double spend happened. Uh, but that that's part of sort of the system and it's about being sort of pragmatic and realizing that we have things that work today and we can use them today and there are risk mitigation strategies that do work today. I think, you know, long run if there's a better technical solution and that's why I'm, I am excited for all this stuff, but I don't, I don't think it makes sense to just destroy something now that is working 99.9% .9 of the time uh, to, to make way for something that could work in five years, you know? I, I don't know. I mean, I know some people who do very large scale zero cost acceptance for many, many merchants mm -hmm. and have way worse acceptance than 99.5, which is a lot of money on. You should have them talk to us. And they're going to be trying to smile. We've got a mailing list, right? I can hear that. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, we need some yeah. customers. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason, posted on the development mailing list, like, hi, I've been double spending Coinbase for the past month. Yeah. How much money I spent, or something to that effect. Yeah. <laughs> Which did happen, by the way. Which didn't happen. Did happen. Did happen. Oh, did happen. Against them, see, one against them, like, that's only two dollars. They only said two. Yeah. Yeah, they only said two. Well, all right. I know other people well, spend more than that. But at least 600 attempts, well, and 300 successes. Yeah, so we know some of them it's actually followers from what they would think. Yep. And um, I can tell you even more part from how some of the merchants track the net. Um, but for the most part, it's, it's like, so say you come in, I don't know about specific merchants, but you know, at least one provider that loses pretty significant money from it on a regular basis. Can we show that too? So, <laughs> so uh, after that, some people have very shaky, very communication strategies <laughs> against it. Or none. Or not. Or yeah. not, exactly. So that's also, you know, you can do a lot of those things if you're not careful about it at all. For sure. 
Yeah. <laughs> wasn't really okay. Hey, hey, can, can we take this offline? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's you hard. Sure things in life, and that's taxes and debt. Everything else yeah. is about risk mitigation. If you don't employ the right mitigation factor, then yeah, right. say Do we have any other questions for Josh? All right. Cool. No other questions, guys? All right. Thank you all very much.